all go through a number of transitions in life. And the transitions affect our identity. Transitions help us establish who we are. Uh, transitions bring in a new reality and exit an old reality. So we think about some different transitions that we may go through in life. Some of the common ones might be marriage. Marriage is a transition where you go from singlehood to then now being a couple. Or graduation, that's another transition that we go through. There's retirement, there's moving, there's having kids, there's the empty nest phase, and there is the time that we left our mother's womb. Now, a lot of us don't remember that time when we left our mother's womb, but if we could think back and remember it, that's a pretty big transition. That's really moving in from one world to the next world. But another transition we're all going to be facing is there is going to be a transition at the end of this age. And we refer to the end of this age as the end, but it is not really the end in that it's now conclusion of everything. It is the end of a certain age and then the beginning of a new age. So it's a transition. It's a transition into what is often referred to as heaven, or paradise. But because it seems so far away from us, and it seems so un... usually isn't something that is on our minds much. So many other things crowd out that whole idea. Even as Christians, there are so many other more pressing matters, we feel, that that is just something that we don't really think about. We might look forward to it. We might hear things at funerals about it. A lot of times, even at Christian funerals, really bad, cheesy poetry. Uh, some of it not even actually Christian, but a little more pantheistic than anything. Like this that I saw on a bulletin at one funeral. It said, when you awaken in the morning hush, I am the swift, uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine in the night. Do not stand at my grave and cry, I am not there, I did not die. I mean, it sounds all poetic and beautiful in that, but it really should make you barf. Um, this isn't even Christian thinking, this whole idea that you've just become one with the birds and one with the air and one with everything around you and that you didn't really die. I mean, the scripture are quite clear that we do actually die. Uh, the whole hope of the Christian is not that we avoid death, but that we actually die but come out the other side through resurrection. The hope of the Christian is that we come back to life again. So we have a lot of misconceptions about these ideas. Uh, and one of it is that pretty much everybody believes they're going to heaven. If you were to ask people, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Everybody says yes. Especially if you've lived a safe and fun, positive life for you and your family. And you went to church maybe at least once a month. And you had a child who graduated with honors. And you have a bumper sticker on your car that brags to everybody else that that's true. You've paid off your house. You've broken 80 in your golf score. And you've recycled. Certainly, if that describes you, you are probably going to heaven. Which is why many people would rather go to hell, because hell, hell, heaven sounds quite boring if it's just filled with everybody like that. What really constitutes heaven? What really is heaven all about? Who really goes there? What are some of these things that the Bible talks about? This heaven stuff seems remote. It seems like it's a, it's a long time into the future in a galaxy far, far away. It's something that is way out there, kind of like how your dessert might look when it's on the table, but you still have to get through your liver and onions before you can ever get to that dessert. And so it feels like it's just never going to happen. 
the, the way a Christmas might look when it's October and you're piled up with all kinds of exams and all kinds of assignments that you do and you know it's there in the distance but it's so hard to see past all of the schoolwork that you still need to do. C.S. Lewis referred to each school term as a 13-week concentration camp where you survived as a pale, quivering, tear-stained, oppressive slave. And he then used this theme to describe how far off the idea of heaven was for people. He writes and says, Life at a vile boarding school is in this way a good preparation for the Christian life in that it teaches one to live by hope. Even in a sense by faith, for at the beginning of each term, home and holidays are so far off that it is as hard to realize them as to realize heaven. Heaven's there, but it's so far off. The age will come, but there's still so many more things that we have to go through. But as frustrating as I find... Many sections of the book of Revelation, for any of you who have ever tried to read that book. I have to admit that the last two chapters of Revelation are some of the most encouraging chapters in the Bible. Now, they make me so excited, the picture that it paints and what we can anticipate. With plenty of pictures and metaphors, John continues to contrast life and death. John continues to contrast light and darkness. He continues to contrast the old and the new. And ultimately, as John did at the outset, the whole point of Revelation is to point us to Jesus. Reminding us that eternity is not so much about a destination, but that eternity is about a person. In fact, this is where I think that Revelation is so often misread in today, and not just today, but in the history, uh, you see so many abuses of Revelation, always trying to put together world events. And in fact, at my last church I was at, about five, six years ago, I did a, I think it was like 12 weeks or 14 weeks through the book of Revelation. We went chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation, and I didn't talk about the end times once. Until the very end and some of the stuff I'm going to say today. Uh, what I did in that series is I just went chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation. And each chapter I asked and tried to answer the question, what does this chapter tell us about Jesus? It's actually a much healthier way to read that book. What does this book, what does this story, what do all these images, what does this tell us about Jesus? Is really what the whole book of Revelation is about. And... The book of Revelation, however, it does, especially as we get to the end, tell about an ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus is going to bring at the end. And today, as we come to the end of our paintings and talking about the second coming of Christ, that's what I want to look at today. What does the last two books, or books, what does the last two chapters of Revelation tell us about this person, Jesus? And in that particular context, it does talk about what does it mean when he comes again to bring all things to its ultimate fulfillment? So the last two chapters of Revelation do talk about a great transition that is going to happen. It's going to tell us this, and it's going to tell us this by using, which is what Revelation does, a lot of pictures, a lot of symbolism. And we have to get through the symbolism to understand the meaning. So, we're going to read again in Revelation 21, just because it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Revelation 21, which was just read earlier. This is what we read. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with people, and he will be with them, and they will be with his people. And God himself will be with them, and they will be, and he will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. 
There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. He who seated on the throne said, look, I'm making all things new. See, this is not just an end. The old order has passed away, but I'm making all things new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my child. Lots of pictures in here. Heaven, earth, bride, new Jerusalem. All of these different pictures. What's going on? What is it talking about? The first thing we have to understand is John begins here by talking about seeing a new heaven and a new earth. Because the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Unlike what is often stereotyped, heaven that John is talking about here isn't some place where God lives somewhere in the cosmos in some location that God has an actual house somewhere called heaven. Uh, what John is talking about here is the same thing that is talked about in the beginning of Genesis, when God at the beginning creates the heavens and the earth. The heaven, the heavens there are referred to as the cosmos, the galaxies, the planets, all these things around us. And the earth that it's talking about is very much the earth that we live on right here and now. And so what John wants to say right at the beginning is that heaven is not a place God lives. Heaven is not a place that we go to. But the sky, the galaxies, and the cosmos. In fact, this is one of the big misconceptions uh, that really is kind of surprising because nowhere in the Bible... Does it ever talk about us going to heaven when we die? You can't find anything in the Bible that talks about that. And so it's surprising how, especially as Bible Christians, that has become so part of our thinking and our nomenclature, uh, but it's been adopted by really pop culture. Uh, what John goes on to say is that God is going to recreate the heavens, so the cosmos, the galaxies, and all of that, but then he also emphasizes, and the earth, that the earth is going to be part of the new reality. This reality is going to pass away. The heavens and the earth, and then this earth is all going to come to an end, but when it comes to an end, we don't all float away as spirit beings into some spirit world. What happens is that God recreates it. And a new heaven and a new earth are made. Just like we are going to die in this body and, and, and this is going to pass away. But we are going to be recreated. Not as spirit beings, but as bodies. Bodies that are raised from the dead to live in the new creation. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation is groaning and waiting for the consummation. All of creation is groaning and waiting for the liberation from its bondage to the sin and the decay and all of the yuck that has been brought into its realm. The resurrection is something that's going to happen to all of God's creation. There is a break from the old to the new. There is a transition but it is a transition in which there's a continuity between the two. When I am raised to life again and I am raised to life in a new body, it's still going to be Steph. It's still going to be me. There's a continuity between the two. Our eternal destination is not to float away as some disembodied spirit into some kind of immaterial heaven. But our destination is bodily resurrection and living on a physically restored new creation. We even see this where it just goes on a little bit after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. It says the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. This new Jerusalem that it's referring to here is described as a bride. Both the picture of the New Jerusalem and the picture of the bride is an image, it's a picture of God's people. 
And what it's saying is that the new Jerusalem is coming down. It's like a wedding processional coming down out of heaven. And it indicates that God's people are going to be placed on the new earth. God's bride is coming like down a processional aisle and coming and it's being placed and going to be living in the new creation that God has made on the new earth. We usually think about a stairway to heaven, uh, but the Bible reverses the order and it's a stairway to earth. What's happening is that we are being placed back onto the earth To be the very people God created us to be. See, our intent right from the beginning was to be earth beings that take care of this planet. God made us. It didn't say, I'm going to put you on the earth. It's just kind of a temporary thing. Uh, And eventually, you're just going to go away from there because you don't really belong there. You belong somewhere else. No, God created us right from the beginning and said, I'm going to put you on earth. And that is supposed to be your domain. You are to take care of it. You are to to take care of the garden and to look after it and care for the animals. And you are to be my representatives on earth. And what's happening here in the new creation is God is restoring everything and putting his people back onto his renewed, restored, saved earth and saying, now take care of it like you were meant to. Take care of my creation like you were meant to. It's unfortunate that most of our popular images of the New Jerusalem is a place in the clouds because that's never the way it's described in Scripture. It's on the new earth. The idea of heaven also as this lush garden is also replaced here by a great city. We have this great city, a city who is also a bride. We just got so many layers of pictures going on here. So it's a city, it's a bride. It's this new Jerusalem. It's the people of the Messiah. That's what we have here described. And here, what we hear about in regards to, or how it's described, this bride. In Revelation 21, 9, come with me, I will show you the bride. God's people, the new Jerusalem. The wife of the Lamb. So he took me. In the spirit to the great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Notice how the bride is married to the lamb. The bride is also Jerusalem. I mean, all these images overlap. I will show you the bride. And what does he do? He shows them the holy city, Jerusalem. That's the bride. Obviously, it's not a city. It's the people. Descending out of heaven from God, it says. And the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were written the twelve names of the apostles of the Lamb. The the, the twenty-four elders who represent the people of God. This here is a picture of God and the followers of the Messiah. The followers of the Messiah are the bride. The followers of the Messiah are Israel. The followers of the Messiah are Jerusalem. The followers of the Messiah are the 24 elders. This is God's people. And the picture of God's people as the bride illustrates that there's going to be intimacy between God and his people. That's the fourth point that we see here. Is that the reason that he uses this kind of imagery, the reason he uses these kinds of pictures is because he wants to let us know that there is going to be close intimacy between him and his people. The Bible is not nearly as embarrassed about marriage and sexuality as the church has often been. In fact, even somewhat uncomfortably, it often uses marriage and sexuality as even a picture of the intimacy and the closeness of our relationship between us and God. I mean, listen to how God speaks about his people through the prophet Ezekiel. He says, You grew up and became a beautiful jewel. Your breasts became full and your body hair grew, but you were still naked. And when I passed by again, I saw that you were old enough for love. 
So I wrapped my cloak around you to cover your nakedness, and I declared my marriage vows to you. I made a covenant with you, says the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. The Apostle Paul, knowing that the prophet spoke like this and using these kinds of imageries, even said in Ephesians, as the scripture says, as it says in Genesis chapter 2, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. And then he goes on and says, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This intimacy of marriage and sexuality, is the kind of intimacy God desires and wants with his people. And he's not embarrassed to express it. And the uniting in one, in the contexts of Genesis, and in the contexts of Ephesians, very interestingly, is not about bearing children. Yes, that can be one of the things that uh, comes out of sexual union. But what's interesting is the Bible doesn't even make that the primary purpose of it. An image picked up in Ezekiel and Revelation is this illustration of union with God. An intimate, pleasurable union. The whole book of Song of Songs is a book in the Bible all about sexual intimacy. And there's nothing, and has nothing to do about bearing children. It's just about the intimacy. This is precisely what's unique about human sexuality. See, animals do not have sex for pleasure. Animals merely procreate. It's the only reason they, they, they get together. Animals don't make love. Animals mate. And so if we were to say the only reason or the main reason for sexuality is just to have children, well, then we're just putting ourselves on the level of animals. It's intimacy. It's connection. It's two lives becoming intertwined with one another. And God is saying that is an illustration of how deeply I want to love you. The connection of sexuality and the divine is why so many pagan religions are sexualized religions have temple prostitutes and, and cults to sexuality and all that is because the two are so intimately entwined. The problem with paganism, though, is that evil is never original. Evil just twists and perverts what is good. So it's not that all of these, this paganism and this sexualized paganism is because they've invented something really weird about sex. It's just because they've perverted the very good that God has created it to be. The intimacy we have with God is further described with the words. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. Notice what it says here. It's so important too. It doesn't say uh, when we die, we float away and we go to finally be with intimacy with God, is, which is so often misunderstood and believed. It says the opposite. It says at the end of the age, when God disorders the way, a new heaven and a new earth are created. We are raised from the dead and we are put onto the new earth. And the bride comes and is placed onto the new earth. This is when it says, look, God's home is now among his people. When does God finally dwell among his people? It's in the new creation. And then it says, he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. The union of us and God for all of eternity in paradise, heaven, the words that you want to use to describe it, is something that happens at the end of this age, in the new creation, at the second coming of Christ, at the resurrection, as the old creeds said, the resurrection of the body. And then God's home will be among his people. This is what it was like at the beginning when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And, and God walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden. It's what the tabernacle represented. The tabernacle represented God's presence among the people. It's why Jesus, when he came the first time, and it said that he came and lived among us, the very words that are used is tabernacled. Jesus came and he tabernacled among us. God's presence was among us in Jesus. 
But the thing is that all of those were only temporary. The Holy Spirit has now come and lives among us. And we live in this tension of, yes, God is among us in a sense, but yet we are still part of the old order of things. But when the new order of com comes, all the barriers of sin and brokenness and disease and death, all the things that still keep us separated from God, even though there's some kind of connection there, will be done away with. And we will once again be in true intimacy with God. That's why Revelation 22, 4 even says at that point, and then we will see his face. Which raises the question, how do you put that together with 1 Timothy 6, 16, which says no one will see God's face. No one will ever see God's face. How do you, how do you put that together? The answer to this is by what Revelation does all over the place. And that is the revelation continues to associate this God that we're talking about with Christ, with the Lamb. Christ, Jesus, is the face of God we will see. Jesus Christ, who is fully God, is the one who makes God's access to us something that we can actually see, even feel and touch. Immediately before we read about seeing the face of God in Revelation to help us understand this is who it's talking about, we read that we will be before the throne of God and the Lamb. It's the Lamb we see, the face of God. Also, Revelation 21-23 states, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. The glory of God is its light. In fact, the Timothy passage that I talked about talks about God being unapproachable light. God is such blinding light, he's unapproachable. And then when we're here in this, uh, before the, the throne, we're in this unapproachable light. And yet, it goes on to say, and the lamb is its lamp. Again, there's so many pictures overlaying here, but what we see is God is unapproachable light. He is unseeable. He's unpenetrable. And yet, Jesus becomes the lamp of this light. And we can see the lamp. Jesus becomes the face of God that we can see. Jesus is the person of God we see. Jesus is the lamb, lamp, light. And we will live with him forever and ever and ever. Just as God came in the person of Jesus to live among us in his first coming, so in our eternal state after his second coming, he will be with us forever. And when he comes, just as Jesus already showed us in his first coming by healing the wounds and healing the broken, in the second coming, it says he will wipe every tear from our eye. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. All these things are gone forever. Which is why the poem that I read earlier, uh, I said not only was cheesy, but actually wrong. Because when it said, you are not here, even though I'm at your grave, you did not die. Uh, the Bible clearly says that there is still death. Only at the second coming does it say that Jesus will wipe every tear from their eye, and then there'll be no more death. No more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, because now all these things are gone forever. Now is when he conquers death for good. And then we also see this picture of the new Jerusalem. And it's described in Revelation as a cube. It, it's a perfect cube. An enormous cube, if you were to take it literally. But what the picture of this cube is, is that in eternity, God's people will be without sin and living in perfection, harmony, stability, and security. We'll not be living in a big, huge Rubik's Cube for all of eternity. It's simply a picture of perfection. The, the, the cube is perfect in all of its dimensions. When the new Jerusalem is measured in Revelation 21, it's described 
as absolutely to perfection in every single aspect of it. As we've already seen, the, this new Jerusalem, now this perfect cube, represents the people of God. It means that we will be perfected. We will be exactly how God intended us to be. Now, we have to recognize something here because some people have a misunderstanding of what perfection means. And then they think eternity is going to be boring because I'm going to go and I'm going to stand at the free throw line when I want to play basketball. And every time I take a shot, it's going to go in. I mean, how boring is that? Like every, every shot. But the perfection it's talking about here is there's no longer sin. There's no longer bitterness and anger. Those things have been perfected. Taking a free throw, standing at the, uh, at, the, at the line and taking a free throw, and missing a shot in the new creation is not sinful. Swearing about it probably is, but it's not sinful. So you will still miss your basketball shots in eternity. It'll still be a challenge to play different types of games. You'll still have to learn things. You'll still be carving a piece of wood to try to make a beautiful uh, a decoration, and you'll still mess up and be like, oh, i got to try that again, because it's not sinful to, to not be able to, to have to learn how to do art and, and, and do shots in basketball. Those things aren't sinful. The thing is, you'll be perfected, meaning without sin. There'll be no more sin. Disharmony between you and God. Disharmony between you and other people. The other thing we see in Revelation is that the contrast of life and death, which is played up through all of Scripture, is brought here to its fin finale. The whole message of Scripture from beginning to end is that you have two choices. I mean, that's what the Garden of Eden is. You have life, and you have life in me. If you eat, I give you free will to choose. If you eat from this tree, you will die. So you have to choose. Do you want life or do you want death? It's what Moses said when he came before the people. Choose this day. You have life and death before you. Choose life. It's what the gospel in Jesus came to say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should have eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. The whole message of the Bible from beginning to end is the message that there are two paths that you can pick. You are not immortal. Life is not something you automatically have. It's not a human characteristic. It's only the characteristic of God. So you have a choice. You can abide in God, which is the source of life, or you can reject God, which is death. And that's what the choices are. We read again, Old Testament, Deuteronomy, today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and cursing. Now, I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life, God calls, so that you and your descendants may live. And here the metaphor of heaven and the new earth does turn into a garden at this point. So it's a city, but it's also a garden. In fact, in the last chapter of Revelation, when we read it, it's almost like a retelling of the garden in Genesis 2. A restoring of the garden. And notice what it happens here. It's a garden in which the tree of life that Adam and Eve were cut off from when they rebelled against God, and they surely died just as God warned them. Now, in the garden that's restored in the new creation, once again, we have the tree with leaves that nourish the nations. And it says, and from the throne of God and the Lamb runs a river with trees of life on every side. And we are to partake of that river and partake of that, those plants, those trees, to be nourished by life. Notice how, again, that the eternal source of life is not something that we have in and of ourselves. We're not, that's not something that's just automatic to us. We have to continually partake of the immortal one. 
That's why there's the river, and the river comes from the throne, and the river comes from the Lamb, and it's the river of life, and we come to the source of life. And it's through being connected to the source that we live. Revelation 22 goes on to say this, which was also read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. I'll give you living water. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing the twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now there'll no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. and They will reign forever and ever. The water illustrates eternal life. Whoever drinks, whoever is thirsty, Jesus says elsewhere in Revelation, let him drink from the water of life, and he'll never be thirsty again. Here in paradise, we find eternal life. The trees give it. The river gives it. But notice how it's not that the river itself has that life in it. It's that the river and the trees all come from the throne of God, from the Lamb. He's the source of it all. He's the one, the immortal one, that just exudes and penetrates all of his new creation with his life. It flows out of his throne and it just filters down throughout all of his creation. Contrast this with those separated from God. To be separated from God is to be cut off from the source of life. They are cut off from the tree. They're cut off from the water. They're cut off from the throne of God. The result is death. It's the lake of fire, which the book of Revelation refers to as the second death. They are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Whereas God's children are given eternal life. And those who reject God face eternal death. And for the rest of eternity at that point, there'll be no longer a curse. There'll be no longer, because interestingly, in chapter 22, verse 3, it says even death is put to death. Death is destroyed. Death is killed. And all things are made new. And finally, because I had to have seven points because seven is such a revelation number. One more thing. It says all evil will be gone. For those of you that enjoy fishing and sailing, I know Bill does enjoy fishing and sailing. You don't have to worry when Revelation says there'll no longer be any sea. Because it's not talking, as this is such a pictorial book, it's not talking literally. That there's not going to be any bodies of water in the new creation. For Jews, and to understand what's going on here, as for most ancient people, the sea represented the realm of evil. The sea was the darkness, the abyss, the place of evil. The mythology of people all over the ancient world saw the sea as the realm of monsters and beasts. In fact, if you go to medieval maps and you just look at medieval maps, they always have on the different maps different pictures whenever it shows. You'll see this here. They got like serpents and monsters. and you, That's how they depicted the waters. The, it's the realm of, of chaos. You see even in the book of uh, Genesis, the beginning, there's the waters and it's all chaos. And, and God comes and, and restores or makes it into order. It's also why there's so much more going on when Jesus calms the storm when he's on the boat. It's more than just Jesus fixing the weather. It's the fact that all of the sea in that represent it for the people, the evil. And that's why when Jesus calmed the storm, he actually says he rebukes the storm. He rebukes the evil and everything that it represents. 
And so that's what this is saying in Revelation. There'll be no more sea means that there'll be no more evil. No more hostility. No more destruction. Therefore, if you like sailing, you can still go sailing. And the monsters of the evil and all that are gone. So Revelation concludes by teaching us a, a number of very important things. That the literal heaven refers to the cosmos. That our eternal home in quote-unquote heaven will be in a God-restored new physical universe and earth where we will live forever as resurrected bodies. God will rule with his children and have intimate, pleasurable fellowship with them. There'll be no longer any curse, sickness, wickedness, pain, suffering, or death. For all these things associated with evil will be destroyed. And everything will be and will remain perfect, harmonious, stable, and secure forever. That's the hope that we have as believers. In fact, even in our denominational, we have this d denominational statement of faith. And I was just this morning rereading the section on we await the Lord's return. And it says the same thing here. It says heaven, and it puts it in quotes, heaven, um, therefore, or more properly, means the new creation. It will not be a purely spiritual place inhabited by spiritual beings. Rather, this realm will be a very real place, a very real physical place. The redeemed will inhabit a renewed earth and will exist there in bodily form. However, the eternal bodies of the people of God will not be like our present mortal bodies, which are prone to sickness and death. Um, anyway, this is our statement of faith I was reading this morning, just affirming the this, this, this same thing. This is the hope that we have as Christians. So you may be asking, well, how do I sign up to be part of this? Maybe some of you are wondering that. Well, Jesus says to all who are thirsty, I will give freely. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings. I will be their God and they will be my children. It's a free gift that God gives to all those who are willing to say, I need a Savior. I've tried to find life on my own. I've tried to find the source of life. And everything that I've gone to, every place I've gone to, always ends up, it might give me a temporary fix, a temporary bit of energy, but it all ends up leading to death. And that's because everything is mortal. Only by freely surrendering to the immortal one, only by freely surrendering to the one and saying, you, my creator, the one who can make all things new and made all things in the first place, only you can grant me real life, freedom, forgiveness, intimacy. Only you can make me part of a new family. Revelation says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who hears this say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let everyone who drinks freely from this water of life. I love that. It's Jesus calls us to come. And then it goes on to say, the spirit, God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride. Those thou that are the bride also now start saying, Come. To everybody else. That's part of our job as the bride. Let's just say, come join the wedding. Come, and in this aspect of it, become part of the bride. Become part of the new Jerusalem. It's a free gift. Christ is calling you to come. The Spirit's calling you to come. The church, God's people are calling you to come. With Jesus, your debts can be paid. God has set before you life and death. Which will you choose? And then, as if to remind us of the big idea of Revelation, one last time, John concludes the whole book like this. 
I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But the angel said, no, 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 don't, don't worship me. Don't worship me. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. And then the last words, he says, worship only God. That's what it comes down to. We keep worshiping the wrong thing. We worship our politics, we worship our emperors, we worship our drugs, we worship our money, we worship our families, we worship, and they all lead us wrong. Even an angel, who is obviously even working for God, he falls down to worship the angel and says, don't worship me, because when you worship even good things, it goes bad. It all comes down to right worship. We become what we worship. Worship only God. Not Caesar, not Rome, not Canada, not America, not Russia, not China, not family, not education, not money or politics, not a denomination or a Bible translation or a theologian, not sports or the internet or science or technology or MasterCard. None of those will solve your problems. The king of rock is dead. The king of pop is dead. The princess that everyone loved is dead. Marilyn Monroe and Anna Nicole Smith may have been considered two of the most beautiful women in the world, but they are dead. France has statues of Napoleon all over the place, but Napoleon is dead. The Chinese government may want to put Chairman Mao's body on display, but he is dead. And you may think that you really are something special, but you're going to die. We don't bow the knee to anyone, not even angels. We only bow to the eternal one, the one who's the source of life, the one who conquered death. The creed of the church right from the beginning was three simple words, Jesus is Lord. Worship only God. If we can remember that, everything else will fall into place. Jesus is Lord. And when this age ends, we can say in the closing words of C.S. Lewis's last book of Narnia, I love the picture of this. And you think about the picture of this in regards to what Lewis said earlier about how much he hated school. This is how Narnia ends. And Aslan is the Christ figure in this allegorical stories of Narnia. It all ends like this. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, Aslan. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them down. And for us, this is the end of all stories. But we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. Look, Jesus says, I am making all things new.